All right, it was April 29th, 2014, and he tried to get up off the gurney in the middle of it. His name was Clayton Lockett. They were trying to kill him, uh, but they really just could not figure it out. They couldn't get it done. They made more than a dozen tries at inserting IV lines into him, more than a dozen tries, including into his arms, into his legs, into his groin. And the whole time, he was supposed to be knocked out. He was supposed to be unconscious, but he was not unconscious. He was awake. He was writhing. He was arching his back. He was talking to them about how much everything hurt. And it just went on and on and on. It went on for 10 minutes, and then 20 minutes, and then 30 minutes, and then 40 minutes. He actually, at one point, ended up trying to help them, trying to help them kill him. He, he tried to help them get the needles into himself because they'd made these more than a dozen tries and nothing was working to knock him out. Finally, it went on for so long that the prison officials who were overseeing the execution, they pulled the curtain so the witnesses couldn't see any more of what was going on. And soon after that, they actually decided that they, they couldn't go ahead with it. Not that they felt bad and they didn't want to keep trying to do it, but they literally believed that they could not do it. They had messed up their chance. It was, wasn't working. They couldn't figure it out. They called the governor. She was at a basketball game at the time, uh, but she heard them out calling from the prison and she told them, okay, if they felt like they couldn't complete the execution, then they should call it off. The, the state would stop the execution in the middle of it. They would stop trying to kill him. So then they started making preparations to basically try to bring Clayton Lockett back. They started making preparations to try to revive him after spending all this time trying to kill him. But by then he was groaning and then he was convulsing and then he was in and out of consciousness. And then finally, after 43 minutes, including them trying to call it off in the middle of it and trying to bring him back, after 43 minutes of this, he finally died of a heart attack. It was April 2014, just botched, right? The, the idea basically, I mean, whatever you think about the death penalty, this is not the way it's supposed to go. I mean, you're supposed to be out. You're supposed to be rendered unconscious, and then they kill you in your sleep. This was the opposite of that. Oklahoma just absolutely blew it. And the drug they were using to try to kill him um, is, a, is a drug that Oklahoma had never tried to use before for an execution before they tried it on Clayton Lockett. And we later learned that the execution team, the people who were actually sticking him with the needles, the medical people and the, and the corrections people, the people who were on the team trying to carry out this execution, they didn't know anything about this new drug. They didn't, they'd never used it before, obviously. They didn't know anything about how it was supposed to work, how it might be different than other drugs. They'd never trained on it. They'd never been briefed on it. And that Clayton Lockett execution ended up making national headlines because of how brutal and botched and bloody it was because it went on for so long because the witnesses saw so much of what happened and it was so disturbing. But it wasn't until months after it happened that we found out really what went wrong there. And we found out specifically how Oklahoma ended up getting that drug and why they got that drug. Turns out in part, uh, it was because of this guy. Recognize him? This little bloody chapter in modern American history uh, is not what this man is famous for, but it is part of his record. Let me explain. Back in, back in 2014, after the, this execution went so wrong, investigative reporters at the Tulsa World newspaper, they were able to figure out, mostly through court documents, but also through their own digging, um, that the state, in that execution, they hadn't followed their own laws and protocols about how an execution like that is supposed to work. I mean, what happened in that particular execution is the state apparently realized sort of belatedly, oops, that they didn't have drugs on hand for this next execution that they wanted to do. And when they figured that out, rather than stopping the process, raising it up the chain of command, maybe delaying the executions a little longer in order to figure out how they're going to handle that serious roadblock to what they wanted to do. Instead of that, they decided, no, we have to do these executions. Now we, we're not going to delay them. We've been under a lot of scrutiny around these executions anyway. We are going forward with them, and they just scrambled. We'll figure out the drugs. And specifically, it was lawyers from the general counsel's office in the corrections department and lawyers from the attorney general's office. Scott Pruitt, the attorney general of that state. His office and the top lawyer at the corrections department, they decided 
with this execution date bearing down on them, they decided that they were basically going to freelance it. They were going to figure it out. Never mind the protocol, never mind the rules. They tried to figure it out themselves. Lawyers from Scott Pruitt's office and the general counsel's office of the corrections department, they personally got online and they said they just started browsing around. The general counsel later explained in a court filing that he and Scott Pruitt's office, they started basically randomly looking around online to see if they could figure out how long it takes for various drugs to kill people. Now remember, they're, these are lawyers. These are not medical professionals of any kind who have any expertise in this matter. And when the lawyers were asked where they got the information that they found about how long various drugs take to kill people, I want to read you literally the actual quote in the deposition and the answer to that question was this, quote, on WikiLeaks or whatever. I did my own research. I looked online, you know, went past the key WikiLeaks, WikiLeaks or whatever it is. That's where they say they found the information that led them to pick the drugs that they picked that were then used for the first time in that state on Clayton Lockett. They found it on WikiLeaks or whatever. They just, they looked around online. The attorney general of the state is not supposed to be involved in a process like that. Picking the actual drugs, that is not the attorney general's purview. Nobody in the attorney general's office is even expected to have any expertise for doing anything like that. And the rules and protocols in the state don't say that the attorney general should do anything like that. And the attorney general, Scott Pruitt, he denied up and down for a long time that he or his office had anything to do with that process. No, we didn't have anything to do with picking those drugs. Why would anybody even say that? Obviously, that's not in the rules. Why would we do it? But you know what? There was an investigation. Multiple sources, multiple other actors, multiple other state officials involved in that terribly botched process of killing that guy in 2014. Multiple people said, despite your denials, Scott Pruitt, yeah, you were involved in this. The Department of Public Safety in Oklahoma did an investigation into the botched execution. And the director of the corrections department confirmed that the lethal drugs in that execution were not chosen according to the protocol designed by the state. They weren't. They were picked by the lawyers. He said, quote, the previous general counsel and the attorney general's office, that's who chose the drugs. That general counsel who was, in, who was himself involved in searching the WikiLeaks or whatever for the drug information, along with Scott Pruitt's office, he later explained how it was that he and these other lawyers ended up in that weird position which they were never supposed to be in. He told investigators that basically it was political. He told investigators that the state was under a lot of pressure to carry out that execution that night, particularly because it was supposed to be a very exciting doubleheader. That night, it was going to be Clayton Lockett, and then they had another guy standing by who they were going to kill with the same drugs right after Clayton Lockett. They were going to do two in one night. A lot of attention for something like that. Quote, the attorney general's office being an elective office was under a lot of pressure. The staff over there was under a lot of pressure to, to say, get it done, you know? And so, yeah, yeah, I think it was a joint decision, but there was, I got to say, there was a definite push to make the decision, get it done, hurry up about it. Get it done, hurry up about it. That was from the Attorney General's office, because that is, it's an elective office. There's an ambitious guy in that office. And they wanted to get those guys killed, get this thing over with. That's right, who cares what the drug is? Who cares if we've never used that drug before? Look something up on the WikiLeaks or whatever. You got yourself a smartphone, right? We'll use something we have never tried before. Who cares? Get it done. And that is how Scott Pruitt apparently ended up making the decision about a brand new experimental method that Oklahoma would try out on its prisoners that led to 43 minutes of Clayton Lockett writhing and talking and trying to get the needle in himself and them trying to call off the execution in the middle of it and him trying to get up off the gurney before finally three quarters of an hour into it, it was finally a heart attack that killed him. Publicly, Scott Pruitt denied up and down that he had anything to do with that, that his office worked on that in any way. The state investigation proved that he was lying when he issued those denials. Now, in the, around the same time that that investigation became publicly known, Scott Pruitt got famous for something else. He, in fact, made the front page of the New York Times. It was an investigative piece by Eric Lipton at the New York Times that eventually won Lipton the Pulitzer Prize for investigative reporting in 2014. Eric Lipton discovered that what Scott Pruitt was doing on environmental issues in Oklahoma 
is that um, he, he was taking letters and documents written by oil and gas companies that were big campaign contributors to him, and he was literally copying and pasting the full text of the documents that they wrote, the letters that they wrote. He was copying and pasting those things from oil and gas companies onto his own letterhead, intact, as if they were his own work. And then he was sending those things to Washington as if they were the views of the state of Oklahoma. And mostly those letters were like berating the EPA about something or another. Well, now Scott Pruitt is who the Trump administration has chosen to run the EPA for the country. And the vote on his nomination is supposed to be tomorrow. But despite all of that stuff, which is known about Scott Pruitt and a lot else besides, um, his vote is scheduled tomorrow. And it looks like the wrench in the works on Scott Pruitt, if there is going to be one, uh, is a wrench in the works that a judge in Oklahoma threw tonight. Tonight, a judge in Oklahoma threw a wrench in the works for the Scott Pruitt nomination. Because there's actually something else that Scott Pruitt was starting to get famous for in Oklahoma. For the last two years, he has been refusing to answer public records requests sent to his office in Oklahoma. He's the attorney general of the state. He's subject to the same transparency rules and freedom of information rules as every other part of the state government. But for the last two years, Scott Pruitt has inexplicably just been rejecting public records requests for documents and correspondence between his office and oil and gas companies. There's no legal basis for him resisting or rejecting these records requests. He's just been saying no. And tonight, a federal judge in Oklahoma proclaimed, quote, there really is no reasonable explanation why his office hasn't complied with public records requests. She described his actions as a, quote, abject failure to follow the law. And this judge in Oklahoma tonight ordered him that he's finally got to do it. He's got to hand over what's expected to be about 3,000 pages of emails and other types of communication and correspondence between his office and the oil and gas companies that have been taking such good care of him all these years in Oklahoma. Wow. Right? So we're finally, finally going to see that stuff from Scott Pruitt's office, from his time as attorney general, which is his current job. The judge says he has to produce all this stuff, make it publicly available by Tuesday. Oh, but wait. His vote to be the head of the EPA is tomorrow. Hmm. Democrats were not psyched about the Scott Pruitt EPA nomination anyway, at least most Democrats. But now it would seem that both Democrats and Republicans might have good, a good reason to just wait a few more days before they vote on him, since sometime between now and Tuesday, we're going to get 3,000 pages of his communications with oil and gas companies. 3,000 pages of communications with oil and gas companies that he has been illegally withholding from public view for the last two years. That kind of seems like stuff you might want to see before you vote on this guy to be in charge of great swaths of public policy that affect oil and gas companies, right? I mean, whether you're a Democrat or a Republican, you would at least want to see this stuff before you vote, wouldn't you? Especially if you only have to wait a few days, wouldn't, wouldn't? When the new president picked Mike Flynn to be his national security advisor, he also announced uh, one of the deputy national security advisors he wanted uh, would be a woman named Monica Crowley. She was a Fox News personality. Not long after her name was announced, it emerged that her last book was substantially plagiarized. And then her publisher yanked the book. And then it was reported that a bunch of her newspaper columns were also plagiarized. Then it was reported that, ooh, her PhD thesis also substantially plagiarized. And at that point, um, Monica Crowley got yanked as a deputy national security advisor. They had to pull her name. The first person who the new president picked to be secretary of the army was a billionaire finance guy who had been a, a Trump donor. Shortly after his nomination was announced to lead the army, it emerged that he had recently been written up in a police report for punching a guy out not all that long ago at a fancy horse auction in New York State. And then he too, Vincent Viola, got his name yanked as Secretary of the Army. Earlier this week, the shortest national security advisor tenure in American history came to an end at a record 24 days after Mike Flynn was fired, resigned, fired, resigned, in the midst of an ongoing and now increasingly serious scandal about his prolific contacts with the Russian government before he became national security advisor and, and even before the election during the campaign. 
The Beltway story about Michael Flynn's firing has mostly focused on the fact that he lied about his contacts with the Russian government to people in the White House. But you know what? Maybe that's not the biggest deal here. The Washington Post reports tonight that he may have also lied about those contacts with the Russian government to the FBI. And that's a very serious thing indeed, because that's a felony. I mean, remember, the backstory here is that there are transcripts and recordings of Michael Flynn's contacts with Russian officials, because the U.S. government monitors the communications of Russian officials. And it is reportedly clear in those recordings that Mike Flynn was talking to the Russian government about the sanctions the Obama administration had levied against Russia as punishment for them interfering in our presidential election. Again, the Washington Post reporting tonight that even though it's clear in the recordings and the transcripts that that subject, the sanction subject, was discussed in those calls, the Washington Post reports tonight that Flynn nevertheless denied to the FBI that he had ever discussed those matters with the Russians. They've got him on the transcripts talking about it, and then he told him in person he didn't. If he lied to the FBI, that would be a felony. If it were prosecuted, he could be looking at serious jail time. That said, the decision about whether or not to prosecute him would be made by the Justice Department, which of course is now headed up by the man who was the chairman of the National Security Advisory Committee on the Trump campaign, Jeff Sessions, who's now under increasing scrutiny over the fact that he refuses to recuse himself from any investigations of the campaign that he was a part of. Raise your hand if you think Jeff Sessions is going to prosecute Mike Flynn for lying to the FBI. No, I, no raise your hand. I can't. The day after the Mike Flynn resignation this week, the Trump administration also had to pull its labor secretary nominee, Andy Puzder. Uh, and now tonight we've learned that the man who the White House wanted to replace Mike Flynn as national security advisor, he has told the White House, no, he won't take the job. Uh, the Financial Times tonight quotes a person with firsthand knowledge of the discussions between President Trump and Admiral Robert Harward as saying, quote, Harward is conflicted between the call of duty and the obvious dysfunctionality. Let's keep going. Tonight, Senate Democrats are planning on holding the floor all night long in opposition to the vote tomorrow on Scott Pruitt to head up the EPA, not just because of all of their previous objections to him and everything else in his record, but now the fact that within a matter of five days, 3,000 pages of documentation that his office was illegally withholding about communications between him and oil and gas companies, those are about to be released. How can the Republicans possibly defend voting on him tomorrow when sometime in the next five days we're getting a 3,000 page document dump on him on exactly the subject he's now being elevated to the federal government to oversee? So the president today held a press conference at which he proclaimed that he's just mystified anybody thinks anything's going wrong. I turn on the TV, open the newspapers, and I see stories of chaos. Chaos. Yet, it is the exact opposite. This administration is running like a fine-tuned machine. <laughs> the, the personnel debacles and the serious scandals that already attend to this less than one month old presidency are really, I mean, without hyperbole, they are unlike anything that we have ever seen at the start of a presidential term. And that's completely leaving aside the issue of policy. I mean, there has been no significant legislation passed since this president has been in office. He has signed into law zero major policies. The only exception to that is his Muslim ban and refugee ban, which he signed as an executive order at the end of January. Well, today, as the president proclaimed how finely tuned his machine is, as he crowed about how perfectly everything has rolled out thus far, including that Muslim ban, today, that too, his first policy initiative, that today, completely fell apart. Administration lawyers, as he was wrapping up that press conference, they were writing to the Ninth Circuit U.S. Court of Appeals today, asking that court to please vacate its previous ruling, striking down the ban as unconstitutional, or at least, forgive me, upholding a stay on it on those grounds. The reason the administration asked the court to vacate their previous ruling is because, quote, the president intends in the near future to rescind the order and replace it with a new substantially revised executive order. This is the one substantial policy they have tried to enact. In this first disastrous four weeks of his administration, this is the one policy they have tried to enact. 
and today he was forced to take it back and try to start over. I mean, nobody wants to see the United States of America fail. But if you want to know what it looks like when a president fails, in every conceivable way, in every conceivable measure, this is what it looks like when a president fails in every way. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.